These are real learning pearls that I've learned while working on the wards. You guys really enjoyed when I shared them in the past, and it's been a few months, so these are a little bit on the older side, but I thought you guys would still enjoy this video, so let's get started. So first, if you have hypokalemia and a low pH, what are some of the conditions you should consider? So the body is acidic, and two of the ways this could happen is if you're having a lot of diarrhea, which is losing a lot of bicarb-rich fluids, or if you're having a renal tubular acidosis. So diarrhea or RTA, type one or type two, not type four RTA, you should remember that the low numbers in RTA have a low potassium. When you have hypokalemia and a high pH, however, this could be from vomiting where you're losing acid rich fluid, or it could be from hyperaldosteronism. So upper GI losses or hyperaldosteronism. If you have hyperaldosteronism, one of the diagnostic clues in that case would be hypertension. What is the treatment for post-strep glomerulonephritis? So in these cases, we start patients on high-dose steroids. What can you tell a patient who is hesitant to start medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder? I've run into this situation many times where patients are feeling like you know, we're starting Suboxone or Methadone, isn't it just replacing one opioid with, the, with another opioid? And one way to respond to this is that medication-assisted treatment saves lives. Based on the literature, uh, it has actually been shown to greatly reduce the mortality risk. So yes, although you are giving them a different kind of opioid, it's a little different from replacing one substance with another substance because you're actually giving them proven harm reduction by giving them medication-assisted treatment. So you can see that the mortality risk compared to the general population was 6.1 times in patients without treatment and only 1.8 times above the general population if they're receiving medication-assisted treatment. Why should you stop titrating methadone daily after day three of initiation? So there's this stacking effect that can occur. And basically, when you're starting methadone, you can just keep up titrating the doses every day at the very beginning. But you want to slow down once it gets past day three or so because it's such a long acting uh, half life. It really can start building up in the system. What type of strep is most associated with non separative complications like post strep glomerulonephritis? This is basically just group A strep. And so the two biggest non separative complications are post-strep glomerulonephritis and rheumatic fever. ASO antibodies and anti-DNAs are more associated with what kind of strep infections respectively. So ASO is going to be more for strep pharyngitis and anti-DNAs is going to be more for strep skin infections. <clears throat> so this is a very small point that might come in handy. What anatomical regions should you consider to help with an approach to lower motor neuron weakness? So the first thing you need to consider is the anterior horn, which can be affected by West Nile virus or polio virus. Then you want to consider the peripheral nerve. So could they have Botox toxicity, Guillain-Barre, uh, if they could have some kind of uh, heavy metal toxicity or chemotherapy that could all affect the, um, the peripheral nerve. Then you've got the neuromuscular junction. So you're going to be thinking of uh, myasthenia gravis, Lambert-Eaton syndrome, and then finally you have the muscle itself could be weak. So if you have some kind of myositis or myopathy, that could cause weakness. So anterior horn has polio and West Nile, peripheral nerves, Guillain-Barre, Lyme, taxanes, heavy metals, tick paralysis, and beriberi, neuromuscular junction, Botox, sorry, I messed that up earlier, organophosphate poisoning, myasthenia gravis, and Lambert-Eaton, and then muscle problems such as electrolyte abnormalities, periodic paralysis, myositis, myopathy, etc. Should you be cautious with replacing potassium in patients with hypokalemic periodic paralysis? These patients are going to be coming in with very low potassium levels, but you should not replace it too quickly because most of the reason that they have low potassium is due to sh intracellular shifts. So as their periodic paralysis resolves, all of that intracellular potassium is going to go back into the bloodstream. And if you had already replaced them with a ton of potassium, they're going to become very hyperkalemic. So be very cautious when you're replacing potassium in these patients. Are tampons still highly associated with risk for toxic shock syndrome? The answer is no. So we classically learned this in medical school as a potential risk factor. Uh, this was because of super absorbent tampon materials that were used in the 70s and 80s. Since then, the FDA has regulated tampons against having these materials. Is a negative MRSA nair is good for ruling out MRSA colonization on the skin? The answer is no. So it has a good negative predictive value for pneumonia, but not necessarily for skin in general. What does hypoglycemia with negative ketones indicate? So if you have negative ketones, that's going to tell you that it is an insulin-mediated cause 
of their hypoglycemia. So either they have an insulinoma or they have some kind of uh, insulin secretagogue like um, sulfonylureas, or they could have surreptitious insulin use. So you can see this is kind of the breakdown. So insulin mediated causes down here is going to have no ketones and non-insulin mediated causes are going to have positive ketones. So the differential is going to be very different based on whether ketones are present or not. When evaluating hypoglycemia, is it important to get studies when the patient is actively hypoglycemic? So when you want to get those advanced endocrinologic studies, you should get them when the patient is actually experiencing hypoglycemia. How does CAR-T therapy work? So basically you take the patient's cells out of their body and then you inject them with uh, some viruses that will modify the genetic material so that the cells will now start to target cancer cells. And then you re-inject them back into the patient where they can start to fight cancer. A lot of times chemotherapy is given before reintroducing T cells to allow the modified cells to be more active. What score is used for the grading of ICANs? So this is a potential complication of CAR-T therapy and certain specific types of immunotherapy. And so they use this thing called the ICE score. And I can never remember the full name for ICANs, so I had to look it up. So Immune Effector Cell Associated Neurotoxicity Syndrome. And it really relies a lot on different kind of orientation questions and other ways to assess their mental status. What are the two main criteria for determining if a patient has at least grade three cytokine release syndrome? This is another potential uh, uh, CAR-T therapy or immunotherapy side effect. So uh, hypotension despite fluids or FiO2 greater than 40% meets greater than grade three cytokine release syndrome. The reason this is important is because these patients should receive higher doses of dexamethasone, such as 20 milligrams every six hours instead of 10 milligrams every six hours. And the ICU should also be called at this point. Why should a renal biopsy still be obtained even if, pa if a patient with rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis has serologies that are positive for for ankyl vasculitis. So with the positive serologies, wouldn't you expect you already know if this is GPA or MPO, for example? Well, actually, a renal biopsy is still very important to obtain in these patients because it actually will help you determine the prognosis. So the treatment for ankyl vasculitis is basically months of prolonged immunosuppression. So if the biopsy shows 80 to 90% irrecoverable damage, scarring, and fibrosis, then the treatment probably is not going to be that effective. It may help you weigh the risks and benefits of starting them on prolonged immunosuppression or not. Whereas if it's just active inflammation, but there's no scarring present, then these patients would probably benefit more from immunosuppression. Could extremely difficult to control adult onset asthma be a presentation of GPA or eGPA? The answer is yes. So always be suspicious if an adult comes in with late onset asthma that's very, very refractory. This could be a potential presentation of GPA or eGPA. What is the treatment for small vessel vasculitis? So of course it's going to be immunosuppression, and in this case it's steroids plus or minus cyclophosphamide or rituximab. Do patients with PR3 positive or MPO positive small vessel vasculitis have more severe disease courses? So actually PR3 positivity is associated with higher severity, increased mortality, and higher rates of relapse compared to MPO positive small vessel vasculitis. Is it possible for eGPA to present without peripheral eosinophilia? The answer is yes. So even though it's eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, you do not necessarily need to see peripheral eosinophilia for the diagnosis. Which ANCA antibody is eGPA more commonly associated with? That's going to be MPO, and that's going to be present in about 30 to 40% of cases. What small vessel vasculitis is most associated with mononeuritis multiplex? Again, this is going to be eGPA. So 80% of eGPA will have mononeuritis multiplex. And just as a quick reminder for mononeuritis multiplex, it's basically uh, one nerve that's being affected in kind of random distributions. So you have polyneuropathy. So that's very common in patients with like diabetes. So you have a symmetric polyneuropathy. Uh, or you have a mononeuropathy, like if you have carpal tunnel syndrome, that's one nerve that's being affected. But let's say you have one nerve in the arm here and then another nerve in your leg that are just not anatomically linked up, that's gonna be mononeuritis multiplex. So again, mononeuropathy is often from compression. Mononeuritis multiplex has multiple different causes. And then polyneuropathies can be classified into length-dependent or non-length-dependent causes. Lower extremity weakness, sensory loss, 
chronic sinusitis and adult onset asthma. This was a very interesting morning report case that uh, had, we got presented to us. And this, of course, was a small vessel vasculitis, probably eGPA because of the lower extremity weakness and sensory loss that kind of had some mononeuritis multiplex features. Do pulmonary nodules in a perilymphatic distribution tend to abut the pleura? The answer is yes. So if you ever see nodules that are abutting the pleura, you can tell that this may have been a lymphangitic kind of spread, and that differential will narrow you down to a lot of times malignancy versus sometimes some kind of infiltrative diseases like sarcoidosis. Now, there's three main patterns of multiple pulmonary nodules that you should, you should know about. So you have central lobular spread, and that's going to be diseases that tend to spread through the airways. So think about infections or fluid. And then you have randomly distributed, which is going to indicate hematogenous spread. That's a lot of times going to be malignancy, or it's going to be some kind of uh, fungal infection. And you have lymphangitic spread, which I also tend to think of as a lot of times malignancy. All right, so again, you've got randomly distributed, you've got perilymphatic spread, look at it abutting the pleura down here. And then you have central lobular spread, which is a lot of times going to be some kind of infection. Why does TB quantifiorine gold have limited utility in active TB? So why don't we just screen patients with a quantifiorine gold if we think somebody might be at risk for active TB? The reason is because actually the sensitivity is pretty low in active TB, only 67 to 80%. So a negative test therefore cannot rule out TB. For latent TB, however, the sensitivity is 96%. So that's why we use it for screening of latent tuberculosis. What is the sensitivity of AFB smears? AFB smears are not that sensitive, but they come back the fastest out of all of the tests that we do for TB rule out. So we do AFB smears, we do a micro uh, bacterial tuberculosis PCR, and then we do AFB culture. And so AFB smears are only 45 to 70% uh, sensitive, but they come back very, very quickly and they're very cheap. The MTB PCR is kind of in the middle, and then the AFB culture is the best sensitivity, but it takes many weeks to come back. And another advantage is that it gives the full resistance profile, which can help with treatment decisions. Can spinal cord diseases present with both a mix of upper and lower motor neuron signs? The answer is yes. So don't be confused during a clinical problem-solving case. If a patient has mixed upper neuron and lower motor neuron signs, uh, sometimes in the hyperacute or acute phase, you may have some lower motor neuron signs still, like flaccidity. Later, upper motor neuron signs will appear, so like Babinski reflex and hyperreflexia. Is it a good idea to set up home health for a patient discharging with Foley and wound care? Uh, yes, you should definitely have a home health nurse for these patients. They would very much benefit from both the Foley management and the wound care. Is midodrin indicated in cirrhotic patients with hypotension and hyponatremia? The answer is yes. One observational study showed long-term midodrine improved survival in patients with cirrhosis and refractory ascites and also showed an increase in sodium levels. However, a subsequent placebo-controlled trial did not show a survival benefit. Can portal hypertension by itself cause gastritis? The answer is yes. So this is called portal hypertensive gastropathy. It's thought to be related to hyperemia and increased congestion in the stomach. Interestingly, a PPI is not really indicated as acid doesn't really play a large role in bleeding from portal hypertensive gastropathy. Should ACEs and ARBs be discontinued in cirrhotic patients with ascites? The answer is yes. So once they start to develop that ascites, get them off the ACE and ARB because they're going to be at high risk for hepatorenal syndrome. And this is from the AASLD, which is the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases. A cirrhotic patient requiring therapy therapeutic paracentesis of greater than eight liters every two weeks suggests what problem? Usually this is dietary non-adherence. So this is per up to date, but if somebody's requiring that frequent of paracentesis, usually it's because they're not being adherent to their diet. Uh, of course, we want to optimize their diuretics as well to try and prevent the fluid reaccumulation, but this much amount of drainage and the frequency at which it needs to be drained usually suggests that there's a dietary component to it as well. What is an additional test you should send in ascites fluid? If the fluid is brown, this would be bilirubin and you should check if there's a bilirubin leak. And this can sometimes happen if there is a gallbladder or bowel perforation that can cause a biliary leak. You can also consider sending an amylase to check for pancreatitis or bowel perforation as well. Should you send ascites fluid cultures in blood culture bottles? I've started to do this more frequently, but it has been associated with increased yield of a positive uh, culture. So in patients with neutrophils greater than 250, so diagnostic for SVP, there was a 100% success in culturing an organism if it was sent in a blood culture bottle versus 76% in patients that had delayed inoculation. And so nowadays when I've been doing my paras, I've been sending them in blood culture bottles. And once you get used to doing it, it's not that much of an extra step 
to just put it in the blood culture bottle right away. Can untreated hepatitis C cause positive autoimmune labs? The answer is yes. So this is a very common mimicker for a lot of autoimmune diseases and positive serologies. So just keep that in mind if you have a patient with untreated hepatitis C and a lot of positive autoimmune serologies. What diagnosis can cause episodic vertigo and sensory neural hearing loss, mainly of low pitched sounds? That would be Meniere's disease. So definitely think about it when you think of hearing loss and vertigo. The treatment is lifestyle modification and thiazide diuretics for those who fail initial lifestyle modification. How quickly can you taper clonidine safely? So you can actually taper it by about 50% every three, two to three days. This is really useful when you have those patients who are on really high doses of clonidine, like 0.3 milligrams three times a day. On the outpatient side, you're probably going to be tapering this a little bit more slowly, but if they're inpatient and you can closely monitor, you can do it a little bit quicker. I will say that I did have a patient where I tried to wean it this quickly, you know, 50% every two to three days, and they did get pretty hypertensive. So um, even though this is kind of what's recommended on UpToDate, be aware that you may have to take a little bit of a slower approach uh, as well if they're on very high doses. And just as a quick reminder, the reason we taper it so slowly is because of the risk for rebound hypertension when you take somebody off of clonidine. All right, and we'll stop this video here. Hopefully you found some useful pearls in there. These are all learning pearls that I learned throughout my time working on the wards and interacting with patients. Uh, sometimes when I'm doing studying or review, I just make a quick Anki card as well. So again, my key tip is always keep a list of all the things you learn throughout the day, either on the back of your patient list or make a OneNote journal where you just keep track of all the learning things. And then after you are back home and you have some time to relax and to reflect, you can turn all of those into Anki cards and kind of store it in your long-term memory. So thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video. And until then, good luck and have fun.